chapter 2. We'll, let's pray and then we'll, we'll jump in. Father, we do thank you for the fellowship that we have with uh, believers here in this room and around the world. And what a privilege it is to be able to unite together in prayer and see you move and sometimes move people halfway around the world for your purpose and your, your glory. We do pray that you continue to move um, in terms of the, the ministry that the Ekman family has there in Israel with your people, and we pray for your blessing, your protection over them, certainly, and, and Henry and Darlene and the others that we uh, may know that are uh, ministering there. Lord, and we uh, ask you now to uh, speak to our hearts through your word as we are encouraged to do in each of these messages to these seven churches to have ears to hear. I pray that we would this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in the past messages, we've kind of set this up going through <clears throat> Revelation in chapter 1. We took three weeks to, uh, to really speak of the issue that the purpose of the book is not to satisfy our curiosity about future events. The purpose of the book is it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And the key verse we've said is in chapter 19, verse 6, that Jesus Christ will return and he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That that uh, the purpose is to have our lives, our view of Jesus changed because we no longer see him as the Jewish carpenter that lived in Galilee, but we see him as the glorified Savior who is the, uh, uh, the Messiah who is returning to rule and reign over planet Earth. And, and we got a very pretty good look at that last week in terms of uh, John's own vision. We're in the second part of the book now, the first uh, part of the book, again, outlined for us in the opening chapter, John would write what he seen, the glorified Savior, Jesus Christ. Then he would write what is going on currently at that time, beginning now in chapter 2 uh, to chapter 3, writing to seven different churches that actually existed uh, there in western Turkey at the time, Asia Minor, and then chapter 4, things that would take place uh, in, in the future. We've also talked about the fact that as he writes to these seven churches, uh, it's seven actual churches, but we'll notice that uh, in each of the openings to each of the churches, and it's to the churches plural, these letters, all of these things were really to be circulated among all of them, uh, and certainly we can find as we go through this that uh, all of the commendations as well as the condemnations and the rewards at the end are for all believers of all times in terms of the church. We have noted that we reject the idea that somehow you can take these seven churches and use it to church, uh, teach church history, that somehow they're indicative only of certain different time periods. Uh, we don't find that to be the case at all. We don't think that was the orig original intent, and historically that was never done until about the 5th century. Uh, the other thing about the seven churches as we get into it is that Jesus picks these very specifically. Obviously, there were many more churches. We, we have the letter to the church at Thessalonica, at Colossae. Uh, we have uh, the mention of Paul's ministry in Heropolis and so forth. There were many other churches in Asia Minor or in Western Turkey. Jesus picks these seven for particular reasons. For example, uh, when he begins to church, uh, talk about the, uh, the, the church that uh, is known for having being lukewarm, he picks a geographic area in that city where there is water that flows down that was a, uh, a source of water for them. But there was a problem with the water. The water was not cold and the water was not hot. The water was lukewarm. Made it even worse if you go there today to that city and you take that water and begin to drink it, you will spit it out because it's very bitter. So Jesus then says to them, and those in that city, you're like this to me. So he picks seven cities in particular to express certain concerns, recommendations or commendations, as well as condemnations against them. And he picks cities because of particular things of those cities. Uh, and we'll see that with the church at Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus is an interesting city. And I, I got to spend a little bit of time just on 
some of the historical stuff as well as the foundation of the church because it, it helps it all make, make sense. Ephesus would be equivalent to like New York City or San Diego today, a major seaport. It's no longer. It's, uh, you've got to get in a, in a bus or something and drive two miles to get to Ephesus today. That was not the case geographically in, in Paul's day or in Jesus' day. Uh, it was a major city. It had at least 250 to 500,000. Maybe a half a million people lived in Ephesus. It was a major seaport. Every ship leaving Rome, traveling, stopped on their way to, to wherever else they were going in, quote, the known world at that time. Uh, and every ship stopped on the way back to Rome. They all passed through the city. It was a very major cosmopolitan city. It was also a city of uh, a great uh, intellect in a sense. There's uh, the remains of uh, what was a a, uh, a beautiful and a famous library at that time containing over 200,000 volumes. No printing presses. That means all handwritten parchments and scrolls, 200,000, huge library. A, a beautiful building you can still tell from the uh, archaeological remains. In Acts chapter 19, we see Paul in Ephesus. He's on his third missionary journey. You remember stirring up such trouble, telling people about Jesus Christ and his being the Messiah and so forth in that city on that journey at that point for a couple of years. And uh, he ends up being uh, a riot taking place in the amphitheater. That amphitheater uh, seats about 200,000. Uh, and you can, even to this day, uh, it remains and you can speak at the bottom and, and somebody at the top can hear you perfectly from the elevated areas you looked right down onto the, uh, onto the sea. Uh, there's still the marble streets that were there in Paul's day, large columns. And of course, it was considered the city that held one of the wonders, seven wonders of the ancient world, which was a statue built in honor of the, the goddess um, uh, the Romans, Romans called her uh, Diana or uh, Artemis. Uh, she was the goddess primarily of, uh, of fertility. Uh, and as you might imagine then in Ephesus, it was a city of gross, what we would consider gross immorality that is not matched uh, in, in this country today. Uh, much worse than anything we can uh, really imagine in terms of the things that took place in terms of sexual pleasure that to uh, historians and archaeologically we have uh, great evidence of this and would be not even appropriate to discuss in, uh, in mixed company the things that took place in, in Ephesus. Uh, that's, the, that's the city. Uh, it's huge. It's bustling. It's, uh, it's got people from all over the world. We're gonna, I want to read a, a couple of passages. If you want to turn to Acts 19, again, the context. Remember, Paul goes there on his second missionary journey. Uh, I, I think this is critically important if we're going to understand and get the letter. And the reason why is the church at Ephesus, when, when, when Jesus is laying this condemnation on them, is about as old as this church is. You know, we, we think there's a big time gap here. Well, it's too bad. They really got off course. It, it, wasn't, it didn't take long. Uh, we had come this October, we'll have been a church for, uh, for 20 years. They're, they're at about 25 years from the time. Pretty good leadership. The Apostle Paul, uh, Apollos, John. How about the membership? Jesus' mother was a member. This is a pretty, pretty good church. We're going to read how good of a church it is here in Acts 19. Again, Paul ends up uh, briefly establishing the church. Acts 18, second missionary journey, returns again, stays here longer than any other place he stays in terms of ministering in a church. He's there for a couple of years. Acts 19, verse 11 says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the disease left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exercise you by uh, the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Shiva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit, spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house, naked and wounded, uh, this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord was magnified. 
I just have to read that part because I think it's hysterically funny. But uh, we're not laughing, so we'll move on. But anyway, you, you get the idea. Some radical stuff going on in this city. But here is the, here's the part that, we're coming, that I want to get to. Verse 18, And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Therefore, we could say this was a church that was really on fire from the Lord. Literally. I mean, uh, you talk about repentance. I don't know how much uh, 50,000 pieces of silver is worth. I think I've got it somewhere written in the notes of my Bible. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it's a radical church. This is my only point. It's a church that is literally totally on fire from the Lord. They have great, great leadership. The Apostle Paul is there for a couple of years. They've got Apollos. They've, they've got everything in the world going for them. And when we read the good things that Jesus has to say about them, there, there's some pretty amazing things. And yet from this time to like 25 years later, they're already off course. And of course, if you're familiar with the passage... You know, the condemnation against them from Jesus is they had left their first love. And it's like, man, that, how, does, how does that happen? Doesn't it take longer than that? Apparently, it doesn't take longer than that. Uh, you know, we read about, uh, uh, in Hebrews, the writer there gives, uh, you know, several warnings. One of them is the danger of drifting, which is, again, unintentional. Nobody means to drift. His illustration that he uses is of a boat in a harbor and how it's anchored. And it breaks away from that anchoring. Nobody does that on purpose. Nobody comes to this place on purpose. They just seem to end up there. Ephesus has been called the careless church. It's been called the the busy church. And uh, obviously it's been called the loveless church. Uh, But at the same time, uh, it's a church that uh, we might say has lost its, its priorities. And it's not because they're not serving the Lord. <clears throat> Let's jump in into the text and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Again, chapter 2, verse 1, to the angel of the church at Ephesus write, these things uh, says, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the seven golden menorahs or lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have, and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Excuse me. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Uh, But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The first thing we note is that Jesus communicates his message to the church at Ephesus. And then he does that. He says he's controlling the the seven angels. And uh, we kind of, again, the John in writing takes, as the Holy Spirit is inspiring, directing, takes a portion of this description of Jesus Christ from chapter 1. Therefore, important to have gone through that in context and then uses that in a portion of the opening to the letter. In this case, we've already had this uh, explained to us in the previous chapter that Jesus, in fact, again, these seven stars represent these seven angels. Now, some people like to, and we were talking about it last night. Uh, the word angel also means messenger. So is this letter t- being delivered to uh, the seven messengers or pastors of these churches or seven angels? How about it says angels and we'll just stick with that, you know? And, uh, and again, we'll, we're trying to stay as literally as we can. When it's a metaphor, we know that it's a metaphor when it's symbolic language, it's usually obvious. When it's a simile, we've noticed uh, that, uh, that uh, those are used about uh, 85 times uh, in, in the book. And when there's a direct reference that takes us to the Old Testament, then it opens up and we get a fuller picture. <clears throat> Let's not make it any harder than it has to be. It's addressed to seven angels. What's the point? Jesus says, by the way, I'm in charge of the church, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> I'm controlling what's going on here. What's going on with them? persecution. 
terrible persecution. Domitian, one of the worst emperors uh, from a Christian perspective that lived in Rome. Well, again, a lot of those emperors were deified at their death. In other words, they served, and after they died, they were deified, like Mao Zedong, if you didn't know that. In China, he gets deified at his death, and we stood in uh, Beijing uh, in uh, Tiananmen Square and watched the crowds by the thousands line up to pass by his, uh, his tomb. Uh, but at the same time, the many Roman emperors were like that. Domitian was different because he deified himself before his death and said, I am God and you must worship me. That's why the Apostle Paul says, no man can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. If there's a Roman soldier with a knife to your throat and says, is Caesar Lord or is Jesus Lord? You're going to have a little hard time, you know, unless you're really filled with God's Spirit and you're ready to deliver your soul, you know, uh, up to him at that point in time. These are the circumstances that they're, uh, that they're living under, and Jesus says, I'm in control of the church, and I should be in control of the church. Uh, and, and I think that's important to note, despite the fact that they had incredible leadership, like Paul, like Apollos, and, and then John himself served as a pastor of this church uh, towards the, uh, the end of his life. Secondly, he communicates the fact that he's walking in the midst of the church, and we talked more about that uh, last week. Therefore, everything that takes place in the church should be central to Jesus and him being, being glorified. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it's very important. And that's why when we gather to sing, which is one of the primary ways that we worship the Lord, certainly worship as we study his word, as we meditate upon his word, as we give, everything is designed to worship the Lord. But one of the primary ways that God has ordained that he be worshiped is through our singing. Good, bad, ugly, or, <laughs> or whatever it might be, it's, a joyful, it's meant to be a joyful noise unto the Lord and to be taken very seriously. Now, I think this is very important in the context of what's happened to this church in losing their first love. I think this there's a real disconnect if we're not worshiping the Lord and still expect to have a personal, deep love for him. That's like saying that you love your wife very deeply, you just never talk to her. I mean, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it, that's only going to carry it so, so, so long. Uh, very important. So G Jesus communicates his message to the church here at Ephesus. Secondly, he commends the church in six areas. And I got six uh, S's from Warren Wordsby. They were good, so... I just went with them. Most of these I'm going to cover very briefly. There's a couple that we want to spend some time on. Uh, first, they were commended as a serving church. He mentions their works. They weren't lazy. They weren't complacent. Uh, when they, they needed something done in the church, they had more than enough volunteers. They Apparently, they had too many. This is a church that served the Lord. So that means it's possible to be involved in serving and serving the Lord on a regular basis and not even really love the Lord that you're serving them for the wrong reasons and the wrong motive, apparently. I think it's a, it's a danger. Uh, secondly, uh, they are commended as a sacrificing church. Uh, again, the word used there in our text is labor. And the late point, uh, labor in the Greek means the point of exhaustion. Here's a church made of church members that if you would look at it, you would say, I want to be part of that church. They are serving. They are active in their community. They serve to the point of exhaustion. What a ride on church. But Jesus is going to have startling words for them. The third thing they were commended is a steadfast assembly. They were patient. And again, uh, in context, it was not easy to be a Christian in Ephesus. It was not easy. You had persecution. You have a, a, a uh, an empire-wide persecution of which there were only a few, but you've got one going on during this context of one of the most brutal men that ever ruled over, over Rome. Uh, not only that, <laughs> you're right in the middle of it, man. You're in the dragon's throat in Ephesus. You know, you're, you're in a place where uh, they worship the goddess uh, Artemis and, and, uh, and Paul's preaching we read, if you go on and read those two chapters maybe later, you'll find that, that every person in Ephesus heard the gospel. The word of God was just, was just going out. It's a big city, maybe half a million people. That's a pretty effective uh, ministry of what's going on. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, as a result, they wanted to kill Paul. Uh, the, the, uh, the guys that made the little metal images... Uh, in the likeness of Artemis, which they still do today, if you visit uh, Ephesus, were going out of business because of uh, so many people coming to faith in, uh, in Jesus Christ. Life was not easy, but they were steadfast. 
Uh, and these are all good things. The fourth thing, they were commended as a separated people. They had separated themselves from false teachers, or some translations, those who are evil. Paul had warned the, uh, the, uh, the elders in Ephesus. Remember that classic scene, Acts 20? Paul's headed back to Jerusalem. As far as he knows, he's going to die there, but he doesn't uh, care what, what awaits him. He's going to go back and give it one more shot to preach the gospel to his brethren and so forth. And he kind of gets his opportunity there on the Temple Mount, but he calls for the, uh, uh, the elders to come down, and he meets with them on the, on the beach and, and, uh, and, and warns them that uh, you know, false teachers will come into your midst. They will even rise from among you, and he's warning them. Uh, and they took that warning, and they took Paul's word, and they, they were not misled by false teachers because they were prevalent as they are today, and, uh, and they were not misled. John had it instructed them in his letter, again, one of their pastors, to try the spirits, 1 John 4, 1. And again, in Paul's uh, warning to the church in Corinth that they may have been familiar with, he states that Satan and his false ministers uh, are there parading even as angels of light and as ministers of, uh, of, of good in the gospel and so forth in 2 Corinthians 11. So this church had great discernment. And, um, and certainly it would be, uh, it was one of the things that Jesus was commending them to. What would Jesus say about the church today? Does the church of Jesus Christ in America have great discernment? What if you think it does? You haven't been to a Christian bookstore lately. It's one of the most dangerous places you can go to spiritually because of things that are, that are sold there that are, not, that, are not from, that are not biblical, that are not reflective of, uh, of the things that are taught by Jesus and certainly uh, in the epistles and so forth. We just live in a very interesting time where uh, we've got guys that unabashedly, I mean, they just say it straight out. Their main objective is to have the biggest church in the country. And then they're able to do it, and everybody thinks it's great. And now they're promoted as one of the spiritual leaders. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It, it really matters what you believe. <laughs> it really matters what you teach and what you say. Uh, your words really do have meaning, and they really do affect people. Uh, and, uh, but j this church, under those conditions, there's a major uh, commendation from Jesus that they had great discernment uh, into when it came to false, uh, false teachers. Uh, listen to what Jesus says and should be a concern for us. Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, had we not prophesied in your name, so they're able to exercise spiritual gifts, cast out demons, uh, tremendous power, it would appear, spiritually in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And then I uh, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So again, there's, we are living, and I think why there's an interest in prophetic studies in these days is there's a recognition that hey, we're seeing a lot of this stuff come to place. We're at the end of the end times. And one of the warnings, one of the concerns is against uh, those who are false teachers. Peter tells us this in terms of why they're, they're false teachers, the motivation to Peter uh, 2, one. Uh, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, you uh, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. Why are they doing it? For the bucks, for the money. Why do they exploit you? Covetousness. I want your money. <laughs> I want your things. For a long time their judgment has been idle, and their destruction does not uh, slumber. And if you study Second Peter, <laughs> it's like, has he seen my TV lately? Because the, he describes the motivation behind why they do what they do. And, uh, and certainly the things that they are commended for, we would pray that Jesus would commend us for the same things. The fifth thing, they're commended as separated, uh, separated church doctrinally. And that's down in verse 6. The word Nicolaitan, again, you're familiar with at least one of the Greek words, Nike, which means uh, victory. You thought it meant Tiger Woods, didn't you, in Greek? It doesn't. It means victory. 
Uh, Laetin means people or to conquer people, victory over people, to conquer people is what the word means. Uh, it involves a doctrine that apparently Jesus hates. Uh, later in verse 15, he says to another church, uh, thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So uh, th- there's, a, there's a couple of, of opinions, and, and, uh, and a lot of the times what this means is, uh, is expressed from something that did not develop in church history for another five or 600 years. You get the uh, victory, laity, victory over the laity. Uh, Jesus hates this idea of clergy laity. That's, uh, that's a common explanation. Uh, but it really wasn't happening in, in Jesus' day. If you read uh, Eusebius and, and a bunch of the other guys that were closer on the scene writing historically, uh, their, their view of this is, is, is simply that there is something where there's victory over the people and Jesus hates it. Uh, and what they believed it was was habitual sin in their life that was dominating the lives of believers. Uh, and somehow it was accepted doctrinally. And Jesus hated that, hated to see his people ruled by or dominated by destructful patterns and habits uh, in in their lives. You can understand why living in a city in Ephesus and these guys didn't go in that direction. Tremendous temptation uh, everywhere they went, every day that they leave, and and they never went in that direction. Uh, And many believe that that's what's uh, being spoken about. And again, uh, as in the case in this book, as I've mentioned, there's going to be times where I'm going to give you a couple of opinions and give you my best shot. I think that's the, the best shot. There could be, have been a, a dominating authoritarian uh, leaders over a particular church, and that could have been a, a thing. This idea of, of clergy laity doesn't exist until, uh, again, another uh, uh, three, 400 years, so it's not exactly that. Uh, but Jesus hates us to come under any kind of a bondage that doesn't allow us to have uh, freedom in our lives, freedom over sin, freedom over habitual bondage to something in our lives, or even freedom over an authoritarian type leadership and not enjoy the fact that every child of God is a king and a priest in his eyes, and we all have direct access to, uh, to, to Jesus Christ, as, uh, as Peter says. The sixth thing they're uh, commended for is as a suffering church. Uh, they had persevered, they had patience, they had labored, they had not become weary, uh, and Jesus commends them for all of these. The writer of Hebrews in uh, Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Jesus doesn't forget. Jesus watches, he sees every. Every Sunday school teacher that's back there with the kids and everything that's going on. He watched the people vacuum before you got here this morning. Uh, The things you do in your home and service to your family members in the name of Jesus Christ. The things that you do on the workplace every time you mention the name of Jesus or that God loves them or you try to turn somebody's heart a little closer to uh, the kingdom of God. Jesus watches every bit of that. He notices uh, every bit of it. It's a labor of love and it, 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 it doesn't go without his seeing what's taking place. These guys understood that. Uh, they were a suffering church and Jesus commends them. So there's a communication to them specifically and I think because of the context of the incredible evil that they lived under that I don't think you and I can Imagine, I, I don't know that there's a direct parallel in the world today. Maybe there is somewhere, maybe in a, uh, in a Muslim country, in a communist country, uh, where there's tremendous persecution, uh, uh, or maybe even uh, other places where there's just uh, outlandish temptation that you and I uh, uh, are unaware of. But uh, it's a specific communication. It's tough sledding in Ephesus if, you, if you're a Christian. It's just not easy. And these, so these are incredible commendations to them. And I think if we saw the church at Ephesus and we knew a little bit about it and we met a few of their members, we'd go, I want to go to that church. That sounds hot to me. Those guys are really living for the Lord. They're willing to suffer. Uh, they have patience. They have great endurance. I want to be part of that. Commends them in six areas. Now we get to verse 4, the one we're probably most familiar with, where Jesus condemns the church in one vital area, and that is in verse 4. They had left their their first love. But notice verse 4, nevertheless, 
I have this against you. And again, a very uh, Jewish way of expressing it, one of tremendous contrast. And this is a contrast. Man, he's laid out these six things that are incredible. And then he gives a major contrasting statement. But nevertheless, it's almost like we're going to have to sweep all of this under the rug. It's almost as if none of this counts, although it's incredible. But compared to, in contrast to what I have to say now, it's like it doesn't even count. So if you thought you were doing well in your relationship with Jesus Christ, you thought you were doing well in terms of where you ought to be with the Lord, just kind of put that on hold right now and dial that back a couple of notches compared to what is really the most vital thing in terms of your relationship uh, with the Lord. And, uh, and it's, again, it's talking about uh, uh, our love. It's, uh, it's a word of contrast. It's, it's not that... Uh, uh, nevertheless, I have this against you. You've, uh, you've left your first love. You didn't lose it. You walked away from it. Uh, you, you left it. Uh, they displayed works, labor, patience. Uh, but apparently, those things were not motivated by their love for the Lord. Have you ever met anybody like that? They're diligent in serving the Lord, but <laughs> they kind of have an attitude about it. You've met me. <laughs> It's easy to do. It's easy to do to get so caught up uh, in, in it. I remember, uh, uh, I'm now more mature, but uh, no. <laughs> to save face, I'll tell an older story. I remember when we first started the church, and we were at uh, Lonnie Kai Elementary, and uh, we were down there, and, and Kathy and I pretty much virtually uh, did about 90% of stuff. Of course, there was a whole whopping you know, 16 people coming to the church at the time. Uh, and Doug and Elizabeth would come, and they would set up the chairs and um, and uh, the cafeteria. We'd get there early and do a bunch of stuff and to get get set up, nursery and Sunday school and all that. And I remember um, and uh, or our Ford station wagon. I mean, just loaded to the hilt, pulpit, you know, uh, bungee cord on top of the the surf racks and the the whole thing. Just the way I saw Pastor Bill do it a number of years before that. And uh, so I, we were there the loading one time, loading all this stuff in. It was kind of a hot summer day, as I recall. And, and I was just, I was really giving it to the Lord. <laughs> I was like grumbling, complaining, you know. Where's everybody? You know, you know one of those. And uh, it's like the Lord instantly brought this uh, image to my mind um, of uh, working for Safeway, 16 years old, we used to unload, uh, uh, when you're low, moan of the, low, low man on the totem pole, you, you get a lot of the jobs. They, they don't do this now, but we used to get, uh, I was working in California, you'd get watermelons that would come in from Mexico right out of the truck that you would have to, you have to hand stack them. They're, they're in the back. They're not on a pallet. There's no dolly. There's nothing mechanical here. You get like five guys, and the first guy grabs the watermelon and throws it to the next guy. He catches it. He throws it to the next guy. And you're, you're like this, and the next guy, you know, he's a good, you know, He's a ways, you know, you're not like handing it, you're tossing it and you lose one once in a while uh, all the way to get them in. And some guy that really knows what he's doing is stacking them up inside. It's about 98 degrees outside. It's about 108 degrees in the back room of the store. It was hard. And Jesus said, what'd you get for that? I think that was like a buck 85 an hour. <laughs> was that hard? That was really hard. How's this? It's glorious, Lord. This is a piece of cake compared to some of the other stuff I've done for a paycheck. You know, we get these little reality checks that the Lord brings to us. It's easy to slide into the condition that Jesus is, uh, is talking about. 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, Paul says, uh, We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. Here's the underliner. Your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's very critical that we can have all the commendations. I, I would think most of us would read that list and say, Lord, I pray I could be like that someday. But it's not, it doesn't matter if you're not doing it because you love the Lord. Uh, and apparently you can love the Lord and then kind of walk away from that. You don't lose it. It's not taken away from you. You just kind of walk Away from it. I want to suggest it's not a fast thing, it's kind of a slow drift, as the warning in Hebrews would say. So what is the first love? Let me give you a couple of, um, a couple of quick views. One is it's a, a love for other believers, and I won't go through these references for time's sake. That's in John 13, certainly that's important. 
It could be a love for the second coming. Paul uh, mentions that in 2 Timothy uh, 4 8. It could be a love for non believers, Jude 20 to, to 23. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. But I, I think the, and those are all views that are taught, and I think with some validity. But again, I think that the primary love that we're talking about is the love for Jesus Christ. What is it to lose or leave our first love. It's our love for, for the Lord. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 20, 34. Uh, they are debating with the Pharisees. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Uh, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Which is it? It's the first and the great commandment. There's a second one. The second one's like it. But which is the first and great one? It's to love the Lord. Uh, again, like it, you shall love your neighbors yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and all of the, uh, of the prophets. So very important. Warren Wordsby says this, The Ephesian believers were so busy maintaining their separation that they were neglecting adoration. Labor is no substitute for love Neither is purity a substitute for passion. The church must have both if it is to please him. And if you, uh, again, read Paul's letter to this church in Ephesus, uh, he mentions the, the word love at least 20 times. Listen to the last thing Paul says to this church earlier, only, only 20 years or so earlier, he says, final words, grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ, with an undying love. Very important. Communicates his message, commends them six times, condemns them in one vital area, but then he recommends the course of restoration. Verse 5, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Again, so apparently, here's the good news, first love can be restored. They were to remember from where they had fallen. And uh, it is literally, it's in a present tense. It, it means literally to keep on remembering. We should keep on remembering from where we have, uh, have fallen, where we once were. What was it like when you first realized that Jesus Christ died for your sins, forgave all your sins, gave you eternal life? It's not based on anything you could ever do, but on his grace and on his mercy uh, alone, that he chose you before the creation of the world and, and drew you to him. Uh, and it, it should, uh, uh, hopefully there's a point in time in your life where that's kind of just uh, an overwhelming thing as a young believer or as a growing believer. And actually that's where apparently we want to remain. Paul warns Timothy about those who are, again, what prevents this? Well, 2 Timothy 3, 1, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves. I don't think you can be a lover of yourself and be a lover of Jesus Christ at the same time. He goes on later in verse 4 and talks about those that are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. I, I don't think you can be a lover of yourself and a lover of pleasure. Of course, that's not a popular concept in our culture, is it? <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> and I think it can I influence uh, all of us. Uh, John, again, it's so interesting, it's John that's getting the revelation, who's been a pastor of this church, when he writes, 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I think it's not a, it's, it's not a both, it's an either or. And, uh, and certainly, again, there's a priority, that's the big message, and it's to, to love the Lord. Uh, secondly, they were to repent and do the things they did at first. And, of course, the word repent means to change our mind, confess our sins. Our change of mind, our change of thinking, I see it differently now, should lead to a, a different attitude and, therefore, a different action or behavior in our, in our life. But it's primarily, uh, it's, uh, it's not a physical thing first. It's a mental thing first. I've thought this through, and I've come to the conclusion that... God is right and I am wrong. So I change my thinking so it's in align with God's thinking. And it's part of how we are to love God with all of our minds. Uh, again, they were then to repeat the, the next R, to repeat the first works. And this suggests the original fellowship that they had with the Lord. And uh, 
Here's where it gets tricky. Because, uh, you know, I would think that that would mean, well, get back to, uh, uh, to prayer and reading your Bible and, and, and uh, these kinds of things that we should be doing on a, on a daily basis, on a regular basis. But, but you can still do that stuff with the wrong motivation. I've met some people that are really disciplined <laughs> in, their, in their, their godly disciplines for Jesus Christ. And they're not the most friendly people to always be around. You know, it's like... You know, it's possible to even do this stuff, right? And do it for the wrong reasons. So it's kind of a tricky little deal here, isn't it? Uh, it's really, again, if you compare it to a relationship between a husband and wife, uh, there's a commitment, there's the love that's there. It's easy for that to grow cold. I mean, basically, uh, we say that uh, God starts the fire, but you've got to keep throwing the, <laughs> the, the kindling and the logs on and keep that thing going. And you, how do you do that? By showing I think, by showing your love. Uh, and I think the more sacrificial, the better uh, you see, uh, you prove your love to your wife, uh, from your wife to your, to your husband. But uh, it all comes back to an attitude. Why am I doing what am I doing? And if I see myself, in other words, I've got to think this through on a regular basis. I should be doing these things for the Lord, but only because I love the Lord. And if I don't love the Lord, I need to stop what I'm doing and try to get this figured out in my own mind. Where did I get off? Or did I get wrong? What am I not considering? Maybe I need to take communion. And when I do, go, that is the blood of Jesus Christ, representative symbolically, and he shed it for me. He was brutalized for me, as we're going to do in a moment. Maybe I need to take that matzah again, see that it's broken, see that it's pierced, see that it's striped, representing his body. And I would be in hell forever had not God left heaven and done that my um, my behalf. I, need to, I think we just got to come. I think the first works is these, this basic issue of, uh, of all eternity. Where I'm going versus where I would have gone. And the only reason I'm going to be with the Lord is because of his mercy. I could have never earned it. I could have never deserved it. I just think it's something we've got to come back to. Apparently, it's a real concern of Jesus for a church that's on fire for the Lord, doing some very cool things. And, uh, uh, and, and yet, it, it's not that long. And they've kind of walked away from something so essential. They were to repeat their first works, and then the warning. They were close to having him remove his presence. He says, I will come. He's not talking about his second coming. He says, I'm coming in judgment. Again, that, that, uh, that menorah, the golden lampstand, the presence of Jesus, he says, I'm going to come and remove my presence uh, from, from the church. How'd the church do? Well, I'll go to Ephesus today. It's a lot of rocks. And there's no Christian witness. There's no nothing there. They, they didn't heed the warning, uh, uh, apparently. The average church in America runs, uh, according to historians, in 50-year cycles. In other words, it gets going. There's something happening. And within 50 years, it's, it's just an institution. That's <laughs> not, not very long. Uh, within 75 to 100 years, there's a clear departure from the Word of God. I don't mean that they don't mention the Word of God anymore. They've come to the point where they don't even believe in the inerrancy or the inspiration of Word of God. It has no authority over them, over their lives, or over the church. That is a typical church in America 75 to 100 years out. How does it happen? Apparently, they lose their first love. And Jesus comes and he removes their, his presence and so now we, we do senior care, and we got a great preschool program. You know, there's stuff you can do, you know, uh, and, but it's, it's, it's not what the church was uh, meant to be or, or supposed to be. One of our uh, missionaries uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong, just a wonderful brother, uh, boss, and uh, he, uh, he's, been, he's been on the mission field for so long. He was with uh, Brother Andrew for a number of years, and, uh, and then... Uh, uh, this, this gets broadcasted, so not a lot of details. But uh, he's down there and, and ministering to the, uh, the house church, and that's who we go with when we're down there. But I was talking to him one time, just seeing how he's doing uh, you know, financially in terms of support and so forth. And, and, uh, and we, we support him as, uh, as a missionary. And uh, he was telling me that his, his home church that sent him out, he's from a, a European country, he's from Holland, his home church that sent him out no longer supports him in a mission as a missionary. And the reason that they don't is because they don't support anybody because they've become so liberal. I mean, they were kind of on the edge of it, 
And by the time he left, he's been on the mission field for so long, the, the church is dead. <laughs> Jesus has removed his presence in a sense. They don't even see the need. You know, they're just interested in whatever they can do in terms of social things uh, and social causes right around their own, their own community and so forth. Uh, just to kind of uh, uh, astounded me. Yeah, but uh, again, the, you can understand the, the danger that the church lies in today that uh, apparently this can happen pretty quickly. But Jesus, fifthly, promises an eternal compensation. Very interesting little verse here in verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of, uh, of God. This is interesting as well. <laughs> to him who overcomes. Now, at the end of each of these that we'll go through, there's a little, there's a little deal at the end for him who overcomes. It's a, it's a reward. Uh, what's the, uh, the tree of life? Well, again, the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden, right? It's what, as long as they could eat from that, they had eternal life. That's why when they sinned, angels guarded it, and they couldn't keep eating and remain eternally separated from God in their, in their sin. That prevented that. Uh, and we'll read a couple of verses about where the tree is located now in, uh, in a moment. But uh, the point is, who is it that overcomes? Uh, well, 1 John 5, 4, I've got it for you. Uh, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Uh, who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. All believers in Jesus Christ are overcomers. How? By our faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. Who gets all the rewards at the end that Jesus is promising? All of us. <laughs> but what about the warning and everything? What if we don't do that? You get the reward anyway. Isn't that weird? See, if I were God, I'd do this totally different. See, I'd be just saying, if you don't do this, I'm cutting you out right here. I'm just telling you that. But, but he doesn't. He says, here's what you're doing right. Here's what you're doing wrong. And if you don't repent, I'm going to remove my presence. But you're still good with me, and I paid the whole price, and you get eternal life, and you're going to eat from the tree of life in heaven, and you're still going to be with me. But whoa, 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 whoa. Well, why should I do that? Because, you know, it's really a miserable life if you don't. You know, you could live the Christian life and love yourself and the things of this world, but I can just tell you, it's okay for a season it, it doesn't pay a lot of dividends in the long run for you, for your family, for your witness for Jesus Christ, whatever you might be doing. Jesus says, don't go there. You know, turn to me, look to me, you know, renew your love relationship with me so that what you do in this life has meaning, it has purpose, uh, and, and, and enjoy the, the benefits of a, of a relationship with him right now. Uh, the other part about this, again, uh, the tree of life in, in heaven, a couple of verses, we see it in Revelation 22, uh, in heaven, a description of heaven, in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. So the, the tree that was a, a symbol of eternal life in the garden is now seen uh, in, in heaven. Revelation 22, a little further, verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates uh, into the, the city. When we don't really follow Jesus in this, what he's saying to us about our relationship with him, we really only hurt ourselves. But it's interesting, isn't it? He's going to go through this, you know, all these churches, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. But he says, but in the end... But notice, it's not to the church, it's in individual. No matter what's going on in a church that a person is sitting in anywhere in the world today, no matter what that church believes or doing wrong or not doing right, when it comes to eternal life, it's an individual deal. You don't get eternal life because you went to the good church. You don't lose eternal life because you sat in the bad church. It's all based on your faith in Jesus Christ. It's an individual thing. But obviously, God instituted two things on this planet, marriage and the church. Both are to be a reflective 
and avenues or conduit for showing his grace and his glory and his love to a lost and a dying world. And, uh, and neither one can do that without, without the presence of Jesus Christ. And certainly we need him in our midst. We don't want to see him remove our presence. And the temptation is to say, could never happen to us. Could never happen to me. No, actually, we're kind of prime. <laughs> Age-wise, we're kind of prime. Uh, and I think that it's, I wish I could give you a, a list. Here's the five things. Do these and you'll be good. It, it's not because it's not something you do. It's something you search in your own heart. And, uh, and this is a great time to do it as we uh, share communion together. Let's pray. Father, we do rejoice that, uh, that we have John's revelation of you. And I pray that we continue to grow in, a, in terms of a, a different image in our mind of, of who you are in terms of the glorified Savior as we looked at last week. Lord, and uh, to hear the, the central message here this week that there's so many good things we could be doing, even suffering during persecution, and yet it's, it's almost like it doesn't matter if, if we're not doing it because we, we love you. Lord, there's certainly ample reason why we should. And these elements remind us of that, and I pray that they would this morning uh, for each of us here. In Jesus' name, amen. That was lost, leaving all to find again. All that was lost. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives He lives, He lives who once was dead He lives my ever-living man I know that my I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. He lives my ever
Your hope and love 